right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashley Terrazas, and I'm a civil litigation attorney at Fox Rothschild in Raleigh and the president of the Triangle Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. The Federalist Society is a nonpartisan organization of conservative and libertarian lawyers, jurists, law students, and professors that seeks to promote the rule of law, the separation of powers, and individual liberty. And on behalf of the Federalist Society, I would like to welcome you all to this virtual North Carolina Supreme Court Candidates Forum. Our chapter usually hosts a judicial candidates forum in person, but we are very pleased to be able to bring you a similar program in a virtual format this year. Uh, one difference between our virtual program and our in-person program is that on this platform, we will be able to leave a little time for audience questions. So if you have a question for the candidates, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom center of your screen and type in your question. You may ask a question at any time during the program, but we will wait until the end to pose them to the candidates. But as in previous years, um, Donna Martinez has grac graciously agreed to moderate our virtual forum. Donna is the Vice President of Marketing and Communications at the John Locke Foundation. She co-hosts uh, Carolina Journal Radio, a weekly syndicated radio sh show heard on more than a dozen stations. And with her husband, Rick, she co-hosts a daily radio show on News Radio 680 WPTF. And so with that brief introduction, I will hand it over to Donna Martinez to get us started. Thank you. Ashley, thank you very much. And thank you very much to the Triangle and Cape Fear chapters of the Federalist Society for asking me to once again be part of this forum. I'm really honored to be here with you today. It is so important that we showcase these statewide judicial races. This year, North Carolinians will choose three members of the North Carolina Supreme Court and five members of the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Now, today, we're focusing on the three Supreme Court races. I'm so delighted that all six candidates for these three races are joining us today. Candidates, thank you very much for giving us your time. And audience, thank you, because by joining us virtually, you are signaling to your colleagues and to the rest of North Carolina that these really are consequential races. Now, some North Carolinian North Carolinians may not even realize that we actually elect members of the North Carolina Supreme Court. They may also not realize that our Supreme Court races are actually partisan contests, meaning that their ballot, when they vote, will tell them which candidate is a Democrat and which candidate is a Republican. Now, my mission today as the moderator is to give voters more information about who the candidates are, what their views or philosophies are that the philosophies that drive their decisions. So we're gonna do our best to, as Ashley said, leave a little bit of time for Q&A. So here's how it's gonna work. First, each candidate will have one minute for opening thoughts. Then I'm going to pose questions to each set of candidates, about 10 to 11 minutes or so for each of the three panels. Time willing, we're gonna take a couple questions and then each candidate is gonna have the chance for a final thought before we say goodbye today. So let's get started with these opening comments. First of all, Phil Berger Jr. is the Republican candidate for Associate Justice, seat two on the court. Judge Berger, welcome. The floor is yours for one minute. Good afternoon, Donna, and certainly thank you to the Federalist Society for having us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Phil Berger Jr. I'm a judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Uh, before being a judge uh, on the Court of Appeals, I was the elected district attorney in Rockingham County for two terms. I served as president of the North Carolina Conference of District Attorneys. I'm currently the only former elected DA on the Court of Appeals, and if elected, I'll be the only former elected DA on the Supreme Court. My wife Jody and I have two great kids. Jody's a public school teacher at the local elementary school, and uh, my kids, one is in college, and the other is a junior in high school. So uh, happy to be with you today. Look forward to speaking with you. All right, Judge Berger, thank you very much. Lucy Inman is Judge Berger's opponent. She is the Democratic candidate for Associate Justice, seat two on the court. Judge Inman, welcome. Good afternoon, Donna. Thank you so much, and thanks to the Federalist Society for hosting this forum. People know so little about judicial candidates. It's a great way to educate them. My name is Lucy Inman. After serving as a judge for a decade in trial courts across our state and on the State Court of Appeals for the last six years, I'm running for an open seat on the North Carolina Supreme Court to protect our judiciary from partisan politics and ideology that threaten the independence 
of our courts and the separation of powers guaranteed in our state constitution. I've been endorsed by three former North Carolina chief justices, dozens of retired and former judges and lawyers, um, both Democrats and Republican, who have confidence in my ability to leave politics at the courthouse steps. I look forward to answering your questions. Judge Inman, thank you very much. Tamara Beringer is the Republican candidate for Associate Justice, seat four on the court. Senator Beringer, welcome. You have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Donna, and also thank you so much to the Federalist Society for this opportunity. I am Tamara Beringer, candidate for the North Carolina Supreme Court. As a Supreme Court Justice, I will bring 35 years of practical legal experience in tax and business law. For over 25 years, I represented small businesses and families in tax and business matters. Uh, I spent, uh, I now, for the last 15 years, have been a, a, a teacher, a professor at the business school in Chapel Hill, where I teach law and ethics to master of accounting students and aspiring business leaders in the undergraduate program. Uh, before that, I spent five years as a professor at the business school at NC State University. And then before that, I taught in the Meredith Paralegal Program, also business law. Uh, for over six years, I served as a North Carolina senator representing Southern Wake County. Uh, and while I was there, I chaired the Judiciary Committee uh, and also authored many of the bills that are now law that regard tax and business and also foster care and children and families. For 10 years, my husband, Brent, and I were therapeutic foster parents with the Methodist Home for Children. And as a result of that, we have three lovely adopted children. Brent and I have been married for 38 years, uh, and I'm so proud of my family and my children. I'm running for the court because we need stability in our justice system. We need safety, and we need judges who will not legislate from the bench. Senator Beringer, thank you very much. Mark Davis is Senator Beringer's opponent for seat four. He is the Democratic candidate for this seat. Justice Davis, welcome. Thank you, Donna, and thank you to the Federalist Society for hosting this event. My name is Mark Davis. I have had the, the honor of serving on the Supreme Court of North Carolina since March of 2019. Before that, I spent six years as an associate judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals. In my almost eight years as an appellate judge, I've authored over 500 opinions and decided over 1,500 cases. Before becoming a judge, I was a practicing attorney for 17 years. I spent 13 of those at the law firm of Walmart, Carlisle, Sandwich, and Rice. I spent four and a half years in the North Carolina Department of Justice as a special deputy attorney general. As an attorney, I handled over 65 appeals in the state and federal courts, and I litigated over 200 cases. I just published a book about the North Carolina Supreme Court that came out about a year ago, uh, and I just uh, rotated off as a member of the Board of Governors of the North Carolina Bar Association. My wife, Marsha, and I have been married for 28 years, and we have three children, and I'm truly delighted to be here. Thank you again. Justice Davis, thank you very much. Sherry Beasley is the Democratic candidate for Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. Chief Justice Beasley, welcome. Please share your opening thoughts. Thank you so much, Donna. Uh, thank you, Ashley, and to all the members of the <clears throat> Federalist Society and everyone who's in attendance here today. Uh, I know that we all wish that we could be there in person, but I'm so glad that we've been given this opportunity to come together in this way. I am Sherry Beasley, and I'm currently serving as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of North Carolina. I have served as the Chief Justice for almost a year and a half, having been appointed by Governor Roy Cooper in February of 2019. I've served on the Supreme Court of North Carolina for seven years. I served on the North Carolina Court of Appeals for four years, and I served as a district court judge in Cumberland County for 10 years, presiding in all the courts there, family court, juvenile court, civil, criminal, and traffic courts. Before that, I served as an assistant public defender in Cumberland County, did a little bit of work in the district attorney's office in Wake County, and worked in some corporations in Research Triangle Park before then. Um, this has uh, been an amazing time to be able to lead our courts, and I'm so honored uh, to be able to do that. I am a graduate of Rutgers College, Rutgers University in New Jersey, um, and with majors in political science and economics. Um, I have graduated from law school at the University of Tennessee College of Law, and I received my LLM in Judicial Studies from Duke University Law School. Uh, I am married to Curtis. Uh, we have been married and just celebrated our 27th anniversary. 
We're the very proud parents of twin sons, Matthew and Thomas, 19 years old, both of whom are college students and uh, amazing they're still away uh, because of, uh, and not back home because of the coronavirus. And we're also uh, the parents of a small dog, Stanley Clark. I'm delighted to be here. I look forward to the conversation today and questions from the audience. Thanks so much. Chief Justice Beasley, thank you very much. Uh, Paul Newby is Chief Justice Beasley's opponent for Chief Justice. He is the Republican candidate for the seat. Justice Newby, welcome. Thank you, and thank you to everyone for uh, watching this because the courts are important, they're significant. I am Paul Newby, I'm the Senior Associate Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. That means I'm the longest serving justice. I've been on the court for 16 years, having first been elected in 2004. I've practiced law for 40 years. And um, uh, during that practice uh, time, I spent my first five years as a transactional attorney. Uh, the next uh, 20 years were spent uh, as a litigator doing both civil and criminal litigation. Uh, and then, in, as I said, 2004, I was elected to the Supreme Court. I've been a, a member of the Federal Society for quite a while uh, because the reasons for this society are certainly uh, 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 foundational to my judicial philosophy in terms of the checks and balances that are important, uh, the limitation on government, the emphasis on individual rights, individual freedoms that our Declaration of Independence says are God-given. So um, I look forward to our discussion today. Um, in addition to being on the court, uh, I teach at Campbell Law School, where I have for more than 10 years. I've written a book on the state constitution, and uh, I uh, have a very active internship program trying to help young lawyers become uh, uh, live up to the calling that they have. Uh, thank you. Justice Newby, thank you very much. Thank you to all the candidates. That concludes uh, the opening remarks. Now let's move on to our panels. Each panel will be questioned separately. The idea, of course, is to make sure that those of you watching have the chance to see the two candidates together, the two candidates who are vying for one particular seat, and to uh, view their interaction and their comments. So as we're talking about a question that I posed, uh, candidates, please feel free to to jump in with an answer, to agree or disagree with your opponent for the seat, to amplify a point. In other words, please don't be shy. We want this to be a conversation. Now to our first panel. Let's welcome back our two candidates for Associate Justice Seat 2, Judge Berger, Judge Inman. Please join me. This question is to both of you. Section 35 of the Declaration of Rights in the North Carolina Constitution reads this way, quote, a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles is absolutely necessary to preserve the blessings of liberty. Candidates, what does that statement mean to you? And either one of you can jump in. I'm happy to jump in. Um, that statement means to me an adjective um, that I heard just a few minutes ago, stability. We need stability in our judicial branch of government if we are to maintain stability in our entire democracy. The fundamental principles that I believe we must look to are stare decisis or following precedent, respecting the words of the United States Constitution and the North Carolina Constitution, and not changing the court's analysis on any issue without a rare, rare circumstance and really good reason that is explained so that the public can have confidence that we are maintaining those fundamental principles. Well, uh, Donna, thank you. I, I think uh, a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles means simply that we need to be grounded in the Constitution. We need to be grounded in our state's Constitution uh, and, and um, ensure that, that our constitutional interpretation, when we look at uh, cases, when we look at statutes, when we look at provisions of the Constitution, uh, are grounded in liberty, that they're grounded in our God-given rights, and that we do not forget those God-given rights when we interpret statutes in the Constitution. All right, any other comments on that question? If not, we'll move on to question number two. This also is to both of you. 
Judge Inman, Supreme Court races are partisan races in North Carolina. You are a registered Democrat. You are the Democratic Party's nominee for this seat. What should voters take away from that piece of information about you? And is there such a thing as a Democrat judge or a Republican judge? Thank you, Donna. Um, the, to first answer your last question, is there such a thing as a Democrat judge and a Republican judge? There should not be. Judges should leave partisan politics, again, as I said, at the courthouse steps. Um, I do think there are some Democrat judges and some Republican judges in our country, and that's very concerning to me. The legislature, to my knowledge, without the request of any of the, of the judges, decided that these races should become partisan in 2016. And um, what people should take from my party registration, and I'm a lifelong Democrat, I'm proud of that, um, but what they should take from that is simply, I have registered with one of the two political parties in North Carolina, and that when the legislature required candidates to either be affiliated with the party or file a petition if they wanted to be on the ballot, I chose to register and file as a Democrat. I want people to know that I have been endorsed by many prominent and proud Republicans, including Bob Stevens, Governor McCrory's former legal counsel. And uh, when I ran for the Court of Appeals, he's not with us anymore, the late Chief Justice I Beverly Lake Jr. And so I want people to know that I'm not a Democrat judge. I'm a judge and I'm independent and I'm impartial and people of all political stripes have the confidence in me to be that way. Judge Berger, same question for you. You, Judge Berger, are a registered Republican. You are the Republican Party's nominee for this seat. So what should voters take away from that piece of information about you, Judge Berger, and same question. Is there such a thing as a Republican judge or a Democrat judge? Well, uh, Donna, I'm, I'm a conservative judge first and foremost. I, I believe in uh, limited government and uh, judicial restraint, that, that judges should um, apply the law to the case before them uh, and go no further. So, so that, that's the first principle. Uh, second, is there a difference between uh, the registration of a Republican and, and a Democrat? What does that tell voters? Uh, I think it tells a lot. I think it tells uh, voters that the uh, Republican candidate probably tends to be a little more, um, more inclined to uh, be a textualist or an originalist. Uh, Republican judges are not going to legislate from the bench. Uh, Republican judges are grounded in the Constitution and the language of the Constitution. Uh, so so the, the little uh, letter next to our names tells voters a lot. Uh, and, and the fact that uh, Judge Inman is a lifelong Democrat, I think, tells voters uh, a great deal. The fact that I'm a lifelong Republican uh, gives voters critical information when they're making decisions, and uh, especially a decision that's going to come up uh, here in a few weeks. So, so I, I think, yes, um, the, the party registration is important, and it gives information to voters. Uh, and, and then second, uh, are, are there Republican judges and Democrat judges? I'm a conservative judge, and uh, I think most people uh, would agree with that and understand that. Any other comments on that question? All right, we'll move on to question number three. This is for both of you. Do you believe it is appropriate to use legislative history or the purpose of a statute in order to interpret the statute as opposed to determining the meaning of a statute based on its words and phrases without regard to purpose. Do you think these modes of interpretation give appellate judges room to lean on their own policy preferences in interpreting the statute? Whoever would like to take the floor first is welcome. Well, first of all, judges do not play in public policy. So the, the last part of uh, your question, I would say, uh, is just a little bit off. Uh, if judges who, who dabble in public policy um, are, are more inclined to disrupt uh, what the legislature has put in place. And uh, that's not the role of a judge. A judge is to apply the law as written. And, and you only go to legislative history or legislative intent if there's ambiguity in the statute. 
uh, where a statute is clear and unambiguous, uh, then you apply the law as written. Uh, judges who create ambiguity or conjure ambiguity uh, have, in effect, amended the statute or amended a constitutional provision. That's, that's impermissible in our system of government. And uh, unfortunately, we've got uh, judges across the country uh, who engage in uh, living document interpretation and freely substitute that, their will for that of the legislature, that of the, uh, uh, the founders. Uh, I, th I think that's wrong. Uh, so so I, I don't think judges should get involved in public policy de decisions. That's for the legislature. Uh, and certainly uh, constitutional interpretation, statutory interpretation, depends on ambiguity. And again, judges should not, uh, of their own free will, create ambiguity. Um, I, uh, thank you so much for that question. And I will just preface this by saying that at the Court of Appeals, where I serve, where Judge Berger serves, there's not going to be a lot of ambiguity. And indeed, you start with the text of the, of the statute. And, and if the plain meaning is clear, you go no further at all. Um, some judges, you'd be surprised, think that the plain meaning is something different than another judge on the same panel. And when you have that kind of disagreement, um, each may be saying the other is conjuring an ambiguity, um, but really that shows the discipline and the tiered interpretive theories that we must use to keep our system stable. I've written over 450 opinions in my six years on the Court of Appeals. I'm not aware of anyone asserting that I have conjured an ambiguity, um, created an ambiguity. Um, I am certainly aware of decisions when judges have disagreed about what a statute meant and going to the statutory, to the legislative history, you are correct, Donna, that judges, and, and Judge Berger's correct, judges should never engage in policy. But the further you get away from the text, the more careful each judge and each court must be that the reason that it's looking any further beyond is because it's necessary. And then it needs to, what I call, show its work. I learned this in, in um, middle school math. You don't get full credit if you just give the answer. You must explain your work. And then the reader can decide, was there an ambiguity? Was it plain meaning? Was it conjured? That is how the voters can hold judge justices accountable by, by reading and understanding for themselves. Other comments? Well, I, I, Donna, I would just say that, uh, you know, I've, I've told uh, members of the Federalist Society, I've told everyone in the state uh, that I am an originalist and a textualist. Um, I, I would be interested in Judge Inman's um, judicial philosophy. Oh, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, I see originalism and the living document philosophy as sort of being two ends of a spectrum. And um, originalism and textualism are very similar, but textualism, as I understand it, is interpreting the document, whether it's a constitution or a statute or a regulation, by the meaning of its text without resort to outside information, including legislative history. I see these philosophies, including structuralism, which means if you're interpreting one part of the Constitution, you might look at another part in order to understand it if it's not clear on its own. If you're looking at a statute, you might compare it to other parts of the statute. That's called structuralism. There's consequentialism, which is concern about the consequences. Uh, Justice Gorsuch recently penned an opinion for the U.S. Supreme Court that was purely textualist in his view and resulted in overturning a thousand-year prison sentence and calling into question thousands of criminal convictions in the state of Oklahoma because he decided his textual interpretation was that there was still an Indian reservation over half of Oklahoma. And I would just submit that I see these as tools in a toolbox. You use what you need, you have, a, you have a hierarchy, and you certainly start with the text. 
but you don't need a meat ax to do what could be dealt with with a scalpel. And if you need other tools, because you can't understand from the original text, uh, for example, how, what were the framers thinking about cell phones and discovery in cell phones? I think you have to use more tools than one. Well, and, and Donna, I see, I see judicial philosophy as the operating system for a judge. It, it is the default starting point uh, and interpretive uh, ability or interpretive map uh, for a judge. And, and uh, I see predictability and certainty in originalism or textualism. And uh, uh, judges who tend to float between theories uh, create uncertainty for the legal community and for the people of the state. I would like to respond to that. I don't think judges who use different theories uh, create instability. I don't think Chief Justice Roberts in his dissent in that Oklahoma case, when he talked about the terrible consequences of the majority opinion was creating instability. He was using a different tool in the toolbox. I think judges who use different philosophies are simply more, more open to making sure we are using the right tool in the right instance, and we look at precedent to see whether or not a judge's use of philosophy is or is not consistent. Um, so I, I, don't, I do not agree. I think having a default philosophy um, is somewhat like having a, a ship, and you've turned the, the wheel of the ship in one direction, and it's gonna stay in that position no matter what case you come to. I don't think that works. Very good discussion. Thank you to both of you, Judge Berger, Judge Inman. That concludes our time with you. Thank you so much, really do Thank appreciate it. Thank you very, it. very much. Now let's uh, move on to our second panel. Let's welcome to the floor our two candidates for Associate Justice, seat four. Senator Berenger, Justice Davis, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. All right, this question is for both of you. Now, more and more, our society is focused on whether or not something is deemed to be fair or just, rather than legal or illegal or constitutional or unconstitutional. Is it better for a judge to remain detached from the personal impacts of a case, or is it better to be compassionate to the people affected by that case? In other words, is it appropriate for a judge to try and right societal injustices? And if you're elected, would you do that? Well, I'm happy to start. Uh, I think the way judges approach it, it's certainly the way I approach it, that the fairness and the sense of justice went into the drafting of the statute or the constitutional provision that we're interpreting. As judges, our role is very limited. Our job is to apply the law as it's written, whether it is a statute or a provision of our state or federal constitution. And, you know, I think it's improper for judges, judges to let their own personal feelings about the case interfere with the way they decide the case. You know, my bedrock principle is that a judge's personal beliefs, whether it's a partisan belief or some other belief, should have no effect at all on how the judge decides the case. All judges take an oath to follow the law fairly and impartially as the law is written, not as the law, not the way we, we might wish it to be. We are bound by our oath. We are bound by the Constitution. We have to take the laws as they come and interpret them the way they are. And I will, uh, I will weigh in now. Thank you for the question. Uh, I am a textualist. I believe uh, the law should be applied as it is written. After spending almost seven years in the North Carolina General Assembly to see the process of people, uh, senators and representatives, uh, actually representing the people of this state, uh, and bringing forth what is important to the people of this state in legislation, um, it's to be respected. Uh, and, and it's not just my personal belief, it's in our constitution and our checks and balances. That's the way our system was set up. But that does not mean that we should not be fair if you think of fairness in this way. The law should be applied equally and fairly to all people. I'm from a very modest background. My first home did not have indoor plumbing. I lived on the edge of poverty with my family until about the time I went to school. And no matter who comes before me, they have the same right as the wealthiest person or the person of, of meager means. They have the same right to have justice 
fairly and equitably given to them. Uh, and, and it's through, uh, through that process of applying the laws that was written by the people of this state through their representatives. Can I make just one follow up on that? Please. I think Justice Scalia made the very persuasive point that all judges at heart are textualists. All of us start with the words of the legal provision, whether it's a law, a constitutional provision, a statute or a will, what have you. We all start with the words and try to apply their plain meaning. Now, I don't know if you're going to ask us, Donna, the question you asked uh, Judge Inman and Judge Berger about interpretation, but let me just very quickly say something about that. Uh, with the Constitution, um, we are bound by precedent on our court. You know, we don't decide things out of whole cloth. Our job with constitutional interpretation is to look at the text, look at the historical context in which that provision was ratified, and look at the precedents of our court and see how our court has interpreted that provision in the past. With regard to statutes, Justice Scalia writes, again, very persuasively, what a futile exercise it is to try to ascertain the intent of 535 federal legislators. It's often impossible. And uh, he, it illustrates why it's a folly to look to committee reports and sponsor statements and impute that to the will of the entire body that passed the law. And that's why in the 5% or so of the cases where the plain meaning of the statute is not clear, what we do in North Carolina, first of all, there's not much legislative intent even if we wanted to look at it. What we do is we apply well-accepted canons of construction in order to interpret the words that the legislature used. Any other comments on that question? Well, my comment is he is quoting my favorite justice, Justice Scalia. I had the opportunity to actually see him in action in Washington uh, for the dental whitening case that involved North Carolina and what a force of nature he was. The first All thing right. I did when I became a judge, I'll just add very quickly, I went out and bought his book, Reading Law, that he published with Brian Garner. It's about a 900 page book and I read it cover to cover and I loved every word. It was a wonderful, wonderful book and I recommend it to everybody. All right, let's move on to the next question. This is for both of you, and it, it hits on something that, that was mentioned. So what rules would actually guide you on a decision where you would overrule an established precedent? Either of you can jump in. Well, I went first, Cameron, why don't you go first? All right, well, thank you. Uh, I think it gets back to the, the language, um, just like uh, uh, in anything else, uh, previous courts are not always going to get it right. And what did the language of the statute or the Constitution say? And if it was not applied appropriately, if there was no ambiguity at the time that that precedent was established, then it should be overturned. I think it all begins there with those words that were set forth in the Constitution of North Carolina and also the Constitution of the United States, or if it is not a constitutional matter, the statutes that were enacted by the representatives of the people. So I'm sorry, repeat the question, please. Sure. Um, exactly what rules would guide you on a decision to overturn a precedent? So I'm a big believer in the doctrine of stare decisis, the idea that courts should follow their own precedents. And I think every Supreme Court in the United States uh, of every state feels that way. Our court in North Carolina is particularly uh, strongly attached to the doctrine of stare decisis, and we've said so in many of our opinions. And uh, I think it should very much be an unusual situation for our court to overrule one of our prior decisions. You know, the, the reasons for, for stare decisis are obvious. We want there to be stability and continuity in the law. We don't want different incarnations of the Supreme Court changing their mind every few years and going back and forth on a particular issue. Parties, litigants, lawyers, they have the right to rely on what we say as the law and to govern themselves accordingly, whether it's a contract, whether it's some other form of human behavior, they need to know what the law is. Now, maybe once in a blue moon, we will look hard at one of our prior precedents and we'll decide that it was wrongly decided or for some unusual reason, the rule no longer has applicability today. But I think that should be by far the exception rather than the rule. I think stare decisis is crucial and I think the jurisprudence of our court adheres to that notion. 
And I agree that stability is absolutely critical. It's critical for families. It's critical for business. Uh, when I was in the uh, General Assembly, uh, I uh, wrote the Business Court Modernization Act. I drafted that bill. And one of the things that we, um, we with the stakeholders did is that we now require the business court, even though it's a trial court, to actually write opinions so that they can be counted on and looked at for future guidance for stability. So I agree totally that uh, the courts need to be stable, but a judge needs to have the courage that when a prior court, and again, uh, it may not be very often, but when a prior precedent is not accurate, not correct, not applicable, that judge needs to say, we need to make a change. Well, speaking of opinions, what court opinion from the North Carolina Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court is a really good representation for folks who are evaluating both of you as candidates of your judicial philosophy or your approach? Either one of you can jump in with and take the first shot at this. Well, I'm happy to start. Um, I'm very proud of my, my body of work. I spend a lot of time on my cases and I'm very painstaking and I really try to make them as close to perfect as possible. And as I said earlier, I've written about 500 of them. But the one, one stands out to me in particular that I am proud of. It is a case I decided I uh, write the opinion for when I served on the Court of Appeals. Uh, back, this was back in 2015. It was a case involving sad facts. Uh, a teenage boy had been sexually abused by a priest. And the boy's family sued uh, the Catholic Church, uh, the local diocese, and several other defendants and brought a number of claims against, uh, against the church and the diocese. And the, the primary defense asserted by the defendants was that under the First Amendment, civil courts had no business interfering with uh, religious doctrine. And they thought that the claims in the case did in fact require a civil court to do that. And I spent a lot of time on that case. I found it absolutely fascinating. I read everything I could read. And I ultimately wrote an opinion which essentially said that several of the claims asserted by the plaintiffs could go forward. For example, negligent supervision, because there was some evidence uh, that this priest had, had done improper things along these lines before. And that and the, the essence of the ruling on that issue was that um, churches are not above the law. If they put uh, someone with that type of history in charge of children, they are not shielded from civil liability. But we dismissed a number of the other claims brought by the plaintiffs. For example, claims against the church that this particular priest should, never been, should have never been made a priest in the first place, or that they should have had notice of his tendencies and taken away that title. And I wrote in the opinion that those claims were protected by the First Amendment, that they were not the kind of thing that civil courts should get involved in because they involved ecclesiastical matters, who should be a, a a, a religious leader, under what circumstances should that religious leader be removed? So I was very proud of the opinion. I learned later the case had settled, and independently, both of the lawyers uh, for each side independently told me how much they appreciated the opinion, how they thought it was correct, and how that led them to amicably resolve the case. And, and that meant a lot to me. So that's the opinion I would give from my own experience. On the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, I think Bayard versus Singleton, which preceded Marbury ver versus Madison in establishing the concept of, ju of judicial review, excuse me, judicial review, and of course, Brown v. Board of Education are two shining lights that we all look to when we think of the U.S. Supreme Court. Senator, what opinion, either from the North Carolina Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court, best represents uh, your philosophy and approach? I'd like to speak about the uh, dental whitening case that I talked about earlier. Uh, and it actually, it's the dissent in the general dental whitening case that really capsulizes uh, my philosophy. It was written by the, the late Justice Antonin Scalia. And it was very interesting because I got to go see the argument uh, and then uh, 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 I waited to see what was going to happen. And uh, in about three or four pages, it was very brief, uh, he talked about how North Carolina had rights as a state under our police power, under the U.S. Constitution, and that we should be able to police our dentists, and that should be the way it should be. And his clarity, his uh, use of, of the wording and textual uh, context of the Constitution was just gripping. Also, just about anyone could read that opinion and understand it. It was written in plain English. 
you could understand it. So if someone picked that opinion up, it was brief enough that it didn't put you to sleep and it was very clear. Now I would like to contrast the majority opin opinion. And, uh, and the reason I know I have such a, a fam familiarity with it is I, as part of the Judiciary Committee as the chair, we were looking in North Carolina as to how we needed to change our laws so that uh, we were not, uh, not, not in violation. And it was very, very challenging or troubling because while the majority opinion said that the um, the dentist could not police their um, their um, uh, their profession as their board was structured, it did not give us specific guidance as to how to structure that board so they could, and so it, it became quite. Um, a, a struggle and frustrating as a legislator trying to figure out what we were to do with that opinion. And so, um, and so for that reason, it really brings home to me how clarity of opinion and uh, uh, clarity of words, and by the way, that majority opinion was multiple, multiple pages long, very, very long. Uh, and so it even highlighted more the clear, concise voice of Antonin Scalia applying constitutional concepts to this very important case really struck a chord with me and I carry with it to carry it with me to this day. I want to thank both of you for joining us for this panel, Senator Berenger and Justice Davis. That concludes our time with you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. All right. Let, let us move on then to our Q&A with our two candidates for Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. Chief Justice Beasley and Justice Anubi, welcome back. Glad to have you with us. Thanks. All right, this question is for both of you. Right now, of course, we're experiencing and living with a global pandemic. How are you, or would you, balance North Carolinians' access to the courts, including jury trials, while protecting public health at the same time? And please, either one of you, feel free to jump in. Well, um, as the Chief Justice, um, when I became the Chief Justice, uh, we had a, a sort of a pandemic. We were just on the heels of Hurricane Florence, and we uh, had some catastrophic conditions, and many of our coastal communities' courthouses closed. And so I needed to enter emergency directives to make sure that we could continue the work of our courts, uh, protect the many uh, court uh, employees who were also suffering from the effects of the hurricane, and so the pandemic, I mean, that was sort of a precursor to the pandemic. Um, I was the first chief justice in the nation to enter an order, which greatly reduced the access to our courts. Um, our courts have always remained open since March of this year, um, but it was important for us to hear the most emergent needs. Um, it was important for us to think about uh, courthouses, which usually have thousands of cases on their dockets, especially in the larger counties, every single day, how to make sure that we were going about the work of the courts uh, safely. And so we allowed for, uh, through these emergency directives, uh, hearings through technology. So there were virtual hearings uh, are different and they are uh, often held by, by virtual uh, means as well. And so, and, and, and we've implemented social distancing and masks and and, and I have halted jury trials. I mean, when you think about the fact that there are so many people who come to our courts who are immunocompromised, um, who would come in as the Vanari, um, and, and we certainly don't want to either put them at risk or make them uneasy about sitting on juries. Um, and then we would have uh, jurors who, of course, want seated, sit in a small box, shoulder to shoulder, and we just want to resume as safely as possible. We currently have every single judicial district in the state creating their own plans for how to resume jury trials, how they can do that safely. In places like Wake County and Durham County where the courthouses are large and the facilities are large enough to make sure that they can social distancing, dis distance and provide other safety measures for public health, those courthouses are, are less likely to have complications. But there are smaller districts which will need assistance uh, locating and securing uh, alternate locations in order to safely hold jury trials. And so uh, those efforts are underway now, but there are lots of logistics that come along with that. It's important to make sure that certainly if those juries are happening off-site, uh, that there is security provided by local law enforcement and a host of other logistical considerations that those districts must 
uh, must take into account. Into account. Uh, we've done the study, uh, the National Center for State Courts uh, has done a study on, on making sure uh, we knew and could feel the bar barometer of how people feel about coming for jury trial. And so we know that most people are reluctant during this period of time. And, and certainly if our trials are to be fair and impartial, what we don't want is for people to come to sit uh, in, on a jury trial or to be selected for jury and not feel comfortable doing that. So I have implemented lots of measures with lots of input from court leaders. I have a COVID-19 task force, which is made up of judges and other court officials and lawyers who have provided their input and suggestions every single step along the way. And that's been really helpful. And, and I've also spoken with lots of judges and lawyers along the way who've offered their input as well. I'm, I'm reminded of the adage or the old saying, you know, I'm from Washington, I'm from Raleigh, and I'm here to help you. Um, one size doesn't fit all. Uh, since 2011, we have had in place um, uh, local plans for dealing with pandemics. In 2011, uh, we had um, uh, swine flu, uh, and uh, we had this ongoing terrorism threat. In each locality, each judicial district came up with its own plan. Um, the federal courts have continued with jury trials. Uh, some of our neighboring states have continued with jury trials. Why is that? Well, our state constitution, Article 1, Section 18, says the court shall be open. Every person for an entry done in his lands, goods, personal reputation shall have remedy by due course of law and the right and justice shall be administered without favor, denial, or delay. We've got fundamental rights that are at stake. Rights of victims, rights of defendants sitting in prison, rights of civil litigants who need to have their disputes resolved. And the question is, um, should we in Raleigh dictate to those in the different judicial districts how it should be done? Or should we say, you have come up with a plan, you've had it since 2011, now keep in mind, the courts were basically shut down in March. So we're looking at a significant delay. Uh, when you start looking at landlords, tenants, when you start looking at uh, different aspects of foreclosures, but then you start looking at jury trials, um, it's imperative, I think, that we protect fundamental rights and freedoms. Uh, I believe that each locality is able to come up with plans uh, and then implement those plans to uh, protect folks as they go in for jury service or uh, go in for trials and this type of thing. Uh, they, the local folks, can better understand than we in Raleigh. Instead of we in Raleigh saying, here's what you need to do and now go do it, we need to be saying, what is it that you believe is the best course? Now let us help you implement that course. So it, it, it seems to me uh, that we are creating a huge backlog in our cases, just as delayed is just as denied, whether it's the Criminal Speedy Trial Act, whether it's civil cases that are being backlogged. Uh, this is a serious, serious issue involving fundamental rights that needs to be addressed. Thank I think you for those. If I may, it, it's important to be mindful that every chief justice in the nation has entered uh, the same kinds of emergency directives. And these are directives really have been entered in order to protect the public and the court officials and court staff. Uh, we have had dozens of court staff and officials who have contracted COVID-19. We've had dozens of courthouses temporarily closed uh, to, to, to sanitize to make sure that people would be safe. Um, and all of the judicial districts are coming up with their own plans. We've never indicated as Chief Justice or the members of the Administrative Office of the Courts that we would be approving those plans. What we do want to do is be supportive of those plans. There were pandemic uh, plans in place and we are using them. I would uh, submit that the swine flu is a little bit different than, the, the, than COVID and that COVID-19 is so much more uh, uh, contagious. Um, but there is a backlog and what we've had to balance is making sure that we are protecting the the public safety health and welfare of our employees as well as uh, the public uh, around the very serious nature of having a hearing certainly a reduced 
a number of cases in our courts. Um, but I must also say that before I became the Chief Justice, there was a backlog. And so much of that has to do with the fact that we just don't have the funding uh, to handle the cases. We don't have enough of the personnel. We don't have enough judges. And so we will have to reckon with that going forward. All right. Um, let's move on to the next question, please. This is for both of you. Chief Justice uh, Beasley, in June, you spoke out publicly about unrest and protests. Your comments included this statement, quote, too many people believe that there are two kinds of justice. They believe it because that is their lived experience. They have seen and felt the difference in their own lives. Justice Newby, in 2016, when you were speaking before the John Locke Foundation, you talked about justice and trust. Your comments included this statement, quote, if people can have confidence in the judicial branch that we're striving to be, as Lady Justice is, blindfolded, can't see who comes before, rich, poor, powerful, least powerful, everybody is treated the same, that is just so vital. So my question for both of you is this, are there indeed two kinds of justice in the North Carolina court system? And if so, specifically, how does that manifest itself and what should be done? Um, I did speak out. Um, it, I was the first Chief Justice in the nation to speak, uh, and, and, and my, my remarks were featured in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. It was important to me uh, as a B leader of the judicial branch of government to acknowledge that there are people who do believe that there are two kinds of justice. Um, this is not just a notion that I came up with. Uh, the prior Chief Justice and his commission on the Administration of Law and Justice uh, commissioned a study, and there were several findings, one of which is that the majority of North Carolinians have no trust and confidence in our courts. Well, as the Chief Justice, I have to care about that, and I can't ignore it. If there are people who believe that there are racial disparities happening in our courts, we must address it. It's important for us to have difficult but constructive conversations around how we can do better, how people, even when they don't like the decisions, uh, the way their cases are disposed of in the courts, that they truly believe that they have been treated fairly and impartially uh, in those outcomes in those cases. So it's hugely important. Um, I, I know that we've got to be thoughtful about how to go forward on this. I'm so thankful that there are so many court leaders around our state and our nation who've contacted me who want to do something, who want to do more. And the thing about acknowledging the fact that there are people who believe that there are two kinds of justice. I mean, we have seen thousands of people protesting all across North Carolina. We've seen thousands of people protesting all across this nation. And they've been protesting around their concerns of disparities in a whole host of areas. And so we can ill afford to believe that the courts are in some way, even when we have the best of intentions. Um, not privy to that kind of bias. And so we must address it. And I'm so thankful that the judges and district attorneys and other court leaders are grappling seriously with how some of the best judges and court leaders in the nation, and I say that public and nationally all the time, um, but I'm thankful that we're all excited about grappling with these uh, really important issues. And even the way we're having conversations with lawyers and other folks who've said for a long time, we know something needs to be done, we just don't know what. And knowing that something needs to be done and working and being ready to, to do the hard work is half the battle. We can figure out what needs to be done and we'll do that collectively. Courts are made to decide uh, cases and controversies that come before it. The judicial branch is to do precisely that. We look at the hard evidence and based on hard evidence, we then make our decisions. It's important that the leader of the judicial branch support the public trust and confidence in our judicial system, not undermine it. Um, so what is the judicial system? It's made up of judges, it's made up of attorneys, it's made up of juries, clerks, and for there to be a discussion about racism within that, you get into various policy areas uh, and frankly, uh, you can be seen as undermining or questioning the impartiality of judges, of district attorneys, of juries. Um, interestingly, we had a case that came before us that was pending when these comments were made that came before us that dealt with that. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly I had to write a dissenting opinion in that case, where it seemed to me, as I said in my opinion, that four justices of the court uh, famously said, as uh, King Louis XVI, uh, that, well, it's the law because we say it is. As we look for any type of precedent to support the ruling of the court, uh, and found none. So to me, as a bedrock principle, and I, I talk to lawyers and judges from around the world. I'm part of the Open World Program through the Library of Congress. Judges come to us in America to seek uh, an understanding of the rule of law and how to uh, better their own legal systems. I submit that if you had a case anywhere in the world you would choose the American legal system with our jury system uh, with regard to hoping to get a just and fair outcome. Are we perfect? Of course not. There's no perfect judges, no perfect lawyers, no perfect jurors, no perfect anybody in the system. But are we the best system in the world? Yes. Are there ways to improve it? Yes. But the way to do that, I believe, is to inspire uh, folks to attain to their highest calling, the highest level of professionalism, as opposed to uh, adopt an accusatory manner that would question the impartiality of people who have uh, participated. Uh, I've yet to meet a victim who cared anything about the race of the perpetrator. Uh, the victim says, I was hurt. I want uh, my uh, rights protected. I want my family member who was killed. I want that person to, um, uh, whoever killed them, to be brought to justice. Justice is blindfolded. Justice treats everyone the same. So where's the evidence that we're not treating everyone the same? And we as a court can, can do that. But in terms of making public policy and public pronouncements, uh, I don't think that that's the role of the judicial branch. Uh, to me, that's the policy-making branch. And when we, the judiciary, swerve over into the lane of the legislative branch, who's the public policy branch, then I think that bad things happen. If I may, um, the Chief Justice Mark Martin's Commission on Administration of Law and Justice was an amazing commission. It was a bipartisan commission. It was made up of business people and lawyers and lay people and a host of folks who came together uh, to over an 18 month period to study our courts. Um, there was a lot of public input and a, a lot of thought, a lot of studies and a lot of data. Uh, and so I think it would be unfair uh, to say that by using that study and that commission's report as a foundation, it was a foundation for uh, the Chief Justice's uh, uh, support of Raise the Age. I and mean, it's been very useful and very helpful in so many ways. And so to say, the data collected by those professionals and lay people uh, who took that calling very seriously um, is really quite unfair. And, and their intent was certainly not to undermine. It was to offer a, a clear uh, out, uh, in, in, uh, outlook on what's happening in our courts and to determine how best we can address those things. I do think it's the, the role of the Chief Justice that if there are things that are not right, without accusing anyone of anything. And certainly if people believe that I had been accusing them of anything, I mean, it, it's been the judges who have really taken the initiative to say for themselves that we need to do more, that we need to have uh, these CJEs or continuing judicial education classes to um, educate ourselves about some things about race. We need to let go of some strongly held thoughts about uh, people who don't look like us. We need to all work on our biases and perceptions of people who don't look like us. Those are, 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 are really quite refreshing admissions that judges can make. And it doesn't mean that they're bad judges. It means that they're healthy. They want to be the very best that they can be. It's not a commentary of who they are as people or as jurors. They're working hard every single day to keep our courts running. And it's so important that they have been emphatic about carrying on this kind of work, and it's important for the Chief Justice to support them. 
All right. Thank you very much. That concludes our time with Chief Justice Beasley and Justice Newby. Thank you uh, for those uh, interesting comments and, and very helpful to everyone who's watching. All right. This uh, concludes the time that we have for panels, and we are going to uh, go ahead and take a question from a viewer. Um, here's the question, and, and this is posed really to any of the candidates for any of the seats. If you would like to jump in and answer, please feel free to do so. So here here is the question. There's been a lot of talk about maintaining stability and referring to precedent today by several candidates. Having said that, the state's Opportunity Scholarship Program, which services low-income students statewide, was challenged several years ago and was previously found to be constitutional by the North Carolina Supreme Court. That program is now seeing a second challenge. Can any of the candidates speak to this new challenge and how precedent will be applied in the new suit should it reach the Supreme Court level. Candidates, I'm gonna open the floor. If anyone would like to comment on that, uh, please proceed. Um, it would really be inappropriate for us to uh, have a comment about that. It is a pending matter and certainly we don't wanna weigh in on something that could potentially come to the court. So it's probably appropriate for none of us to weigh in on this one, but thank you for the question. All right, if I don't hear anyone else who wants to um, have an answer to that, we'll move on to another question from the viewers. Should the North Carolina Supreme Court increase its current caseload? What's the ideal number of cases for the court to hear? Again, the floor is open to any candidate who would like to answer. Um, I will will um, just get us started anyway. Um, I am not a justice on the North Carolina Supreme Court, and I think our sitting justices are in the best position to answer that question. I will note that as a judge on the Court of Appeals, we handle the appeal of every single first degree murder case. The Supreme Court handles all capital cases. Those are first degree murder cases in which the death penalty has been imposed. Um, some folks have said that the first degree murder cases should go to the Supreme Court. I think that's a high volume of cases. And the Supreme Court recently had its caseload numerically, I would say, doubled by the legislature's uh, bill that transferred from the Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court the jurisdiction for review in the first instance of termination of parental rights cases. Um, and, and that to me is a tremendous change, seems to be a tremendous change in the caseload at the Supreme Court. And I think that we would need studies to see how that's impacted the court's work before expanding its caseload in any way. Other comments from other candidates? All right. Uh, thank you to the audience for posing some of those very interesting uh, questions. So now we've reached the point in our forum where it's time for each candidate to offer final thoughts. And again, I would just ask the candidates to keep it to one minute, please. Your candidates for Associate Justice, uh, this would be seat number two. Judge Berger, you have the floor. <coughs> I made the, the mistake that everybody makes, right? Uh, so, so Donna, thank you. Uh, and thank you to the Federalist Society for uh, having us this afternoon. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Uh, again, I'm Phil Berger, Jr. I'm a judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Uh, if you want certainty and predictability from your Supreme Court, uh, I would appreciate your vote and support uh, for me, Judge Phil Berger, Jr. Thank you very much. Judge Berger, thank you very much. Uh, judge Inman, welcome back. Thank you so much, Donna and Ashley and the Federalist Society and everyone who's joining us. Um, I, I just want to add that all I'm, although I'm all business at the court, my life has also been devoted to my husband of 29 years and my two children. And um, one thing it sounds like Judge Berger and I can agree on is that we need stability and predictability and consistency at the North Carolina Supreme Court. And I respectfully submit that my record shows that I am a more trustworthy steward of stability 
and consistency at the Supreme Court. I've had many endorsements, but the big, the most important endorsement to me is the vote of every citizen. And I hope that you will consider voting for me. Thank you. Judge Inman, thank you very much. Now for the candidates for Associate uh, Justice, seat number four, Senator Beringer, welcome back. Thank you, Donna, and thank you to the Federalist Society for this wonderful opportunity this afternoon. Uh, it is very difficult to get to know the judicial candidates, and in just a few weeks, uh, you'll all be voting for, uh, for this very, these very important positions. So I'd like to close with a personal uh, story about my life, so you'll know a little bit about me and a little more about why I uh, will uphold my oath to protect and defend the Constitution as a Supreme Court Justice. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of being a, an impromptu tour guide for my mother and father and sisters to Washington, D.C. And we went to the archives and we found ourselves wandering around that big cavernous building and we separated. And so after a few minutes, I uh, came back together in front of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution where my father was standing. And I looked over at him and I was so proud to be there with him. And I saw something that I'd never seen before. I saw a big tear rolling down his face. And I reached over to my father and I said, Daddy, what's wrong? And he said, he waved me off and he said, absolutely nothing, nothing, Tammy. It's just that in all those years, when I was out in the hot sun, plowing that mule, I had no idea that I'd have the opportunity to stand before the documents that created this great nation. I'm humbled beyond belief. And so you see, when I tell you that I will protect and defend the Constitution as it was written, I mean it because just like my father, I'm humbled beyond belief to have this opportunity to run for office. So I'm Tamara Beringer, running for the North Carolina Supreme Court. I ask you for your support and your vote. Senator Beringer, thank you very much. Justice Davis, you have the floor. Thank you, Donna. One thing Senator Beringer and I agree on is the importance of running a judicial race that's full of cordiality, professionalism, and mutual respect. And Tamara, I thank you for that. But I do think prior judicial experience is the key in this race. Judging is hard. It's very difficult at any level of the judiciary. And judging on the Supreme Court is extremely hard. We are getting the most complex and important cases in North Carolina constitutionally and under criminal and civil law. One of the nice things about being an incumbent is, I don't have to tell you this is what I will do, I can point to what I have done. You can look at my body of work, you can read my 500 opinions, you may fall asleep because they're not all very exciting, but I promise you, you will not find one hint of a partisan or other bias or agenda. I'm so honored to have been endorsed by three former Chief Justices, 14 former members of the Supreme Court and Court of Appeals of North Carolina, 29 former State Bar Presidents and Presidents of the Bar Association, 10 statewide groups, including the advocates for justice and the defense attorneys who don't usually agree on very much. And I'm so, so proud to have strong bipartisan support among lawyers throughout North Carolina. That's very important to me because my bedrock principle is that judges should be nonpartisan. Thank you. I would be very grateful for your support. Please check out my website to find more information about me at justicemarkdavis.com. Thank you. Justice Davis, thank you very much. Appreciate that. And now our candidates for Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. Chief Justice Beasley, you have the floor for your brief final thought. Thank you. Uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here with you this afternoon. My focus since I've become the Chief Justice has been to lead the Supreme Court of North Carolina. And you know a, a, a bit about the very important cases that come before our court and to also lead the judicial branch of government. Uh, based on the study that Chief Justice Mark Martin uh, had commissioned through uh, the uh, Commission of, of, of Administra the Administration of Law and Justice, uh, it has been so important to me to restore the trust and confidence in our courts. Uh, we really do want people to walk away believing that when they've come to court that they have been heard uh, and that they have received a fair decision. I, we're in a pandemic now, but we won't always be in one. And so, so many of my efforts really have been focused in that way. I worked on e-courts. In North Carolina in 2020, we are still using MS-DOS systems. We would be in a much better place in this pandemic if we had had a more sophisticated uh, technology in order to have more matters handled uh, through 
uh, different uh, uh, portals. And so I'm excited about the fact that that work is underway, especially given the fact that that in so many of our rural communities, uh, the courthouse can be 20 miles away. And so it's important to be able to, for them to have access in that way. It's, we've just started Guide and File, which will allow lawyers and people who represent themselves to go on this portal and to be able to follow the prompts and to see that you can file for absolute divorce, domestic violence protective order, small estates, and, and a few other areas. That will be such an easier way to be able to, no, to ga- navigate through our court system. We have school justice partnerships. When I became Chief, Chief Justice, justice we're, we're, I'm sorry, uh, we are way over time. Thank you for your comments. We appreciate that very much and your, your final thoughts here. Thank you, uh, Chief Justice Beasley. Uh, justice Newby, you. your, your brief final thought, please. It's about two constitutions, your state and federal constitutions. It's about do you want folks who will apply the law as intended or do you want folks who will legislate? Um, I encourage you to go and look at opinions. Uh, It's easy for us to stand here today and say, we apply the law, we don't expand it. And yet recently in the Chambers case, uh, the Supreme Court of North Carolina uh, unilaterally expanded uh, class action lawsuits and Walker expanded workers comp and Piazza uh, expanded all types of uh, civil liability in a business context. MedMal, uh, you're seeing the expanded liability there. Is it up to the courts to expand liability or should we simply apply the law as intended? With regard to the Constitution, uh, uh, Cooper versus Berger, uh, you'll see that the word law, which has been in our Constitution since 1776, was expanded beyond its meaning. Do we want constitutional conservatives? If so, I hope you'll support me, Paul Newby. Uh, You can visit my website at paulnewby.com. Thank you so much. Justice Newby, thank you very much. Candidates, this has been really terrific. Thank you so much to all six of you for giving us your time today. And thank you uh, to our audience as well. Really appreciate you being along. So thank you and best wishes to all of you on the campaign trail, even if it's uh, mostly or or not totally virtually. We want you all to um, have a very good experience as you reach out to voters. It's been an honor to be with you today, uh, folks. Thank you very much to the Federalist Society for inviting me to be part of this forum. Ashley, back over to you. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, I know we went over a little bit, so thank you, everyone, for hanging in there, and I hope everyone has a good afternoon. Uh, Make sure you go and vote in November. Um, And again, I I think now we are better informed and and ready to make a decision. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good day, everyone.